What's the worst damage you've caused? Story 1. While in college, I spent several summers working in a salmon cannery in Alaska, and for a few seasons worked in the overnight cleaning crew. They cleaned fillers, these huge industrial revolution-looking behemoths that cut salmon into pieces and put it in cans. The final stage of cleaning these involved climbing into a cavity under the machine where the blade assembly normally sat. It was removed nightly for sharpening. We used thin wire picks, about 12 inches long, to get any last fish parts out of the machine. Inside the cavity was a big drive arm that drove the part of the machine that fed fish to the blades. This arm sat right across your chest as you worked in the cavity. It made for a handy shelf if you needed to set down your pick for a minute. Of course, one day I left the pick on the drive arm. The line mechanics came in and installed the blade assembly, which consisted of about 16 circular blades about three times the diameter of a basketball, and which rotated at ridiculously high RPMs as the machine ran. So the mechanic turns on the machine, only to hear a god-awful screeching sound as the pick is fed up into the blades. It wiped out about half the blades in the assembly, and with no suitable backup, I took out a quarter of the plant's production capacity for the day. And this was a plant that processed a million pounds of very perishable fish per day. The head mechanic who heroically got this thing repaired by the next day pitched me a lot of stuff, but never ratted me out. This might take the cake for most monetary damage caused if the fish that were going to be processed expired overnight. Story 2 when I was in the sixth grade, I caught a dried up tobacco field on fire. I had a knockoff of one of those Rambo things and for a few days was I in the thought of being a chad with nothing but my replica and all the things stuffed inside the handle. I was trying to show my sister how I could create a fire using two sticks. When she wasn't looking, I struck a match, started a small fire, blew the match out, and tossed it behind me. Of course, while we were staring at my small, deliberate fire, flames were rapidly spreading all around us. This was right off a busy highway and suddenly, there were folks all over the place swatting the fire with their floor mats. In the end, a huge chunk of the field was completely charred, and to this day, my entire family believes I was able to accomplish all of that by rubbing two sticks together. Story 3 I accidentally blew up a 6,000-gallon tanker truck and demolished the workshop we were in, about $120,000. I worked for a company in England that built and repaired tanker trucks. A four-compartment truck came in one day for the pipework to be replaced in the rear compartment. I had been told the tank was clean and vapor-free, safe to work on. I got under the rear of the truck to cut the bolt heads off the bottom connecting the flange with an acetylene torch. As I cut the last bolt, the flange gap opened up an eighth and a ring of flame came out. Before I had time to react, the rear compartment blew up, which blew out the division into the next compartment and that exploded. All four compartments went off within milliseconds of each other and the front of the tank blew off and destroyed the truck unit. Luckily, the driver wasn't in it. The top of the tank opened up like the petals of a flower and the whole truck jumped in the air. The explosion took the roof off the workshop and the support wall the truck was parked next to. I was actually in the safest place, which was underneath it, although I had to change my undies. Turns out the tank hadn't been cleaned and had just come from dropping a load. Story 4 I was recently teaching my niece how to drive. She was a natural, and I felt she was ready to go out on the road after only a couple of lessons in a parking lot. She was doing great, appeared to be ready to get her license way ahead of schedule. The next day we finished up her driving lesson, and she pulled back into the driveway to park. She got momentarily confused and mashed the accelerator down to the floor as she attempted to put the car into park. Straight through the garage door, we went, right into our father's motorcycle, then his lawnmower, and finally the household water heater before coming to a stop. It was simultaneously the least dangerous and most devastating crash I'd ever witnessed. That's like being chased by a hungry tiger and jumping in its direction instead of away from it. Story 5 Back when I was a dumb kid living in Italy, a bunch of friends and I decided to play hide-and-seek and inside one of the empty villas in our parka. Since the front door was locked and there were bars in the windows, we decided to break a hole in the side of the wall. Once inside, we discovered that the laborers who worked for the landlord kept their power tools in there. We went full idiot and completely destroyed everything inside that house. One of us came up with the idea that if we hit the big water tank outside with a pickaxe, it would explode. After being disappointed in cracking the tank in half with no explosion, we decided the only way to cause an explosion was to pour gasoline all over the furnace. Before we had a chance to throw those sparkling sticks at it, the SPs and Carabinieri showed up and ruined our fun. What was the worst time you walked in? Rufus Ruggs, open up! Sorry for barging in like that, but I just had to share the sponsor of today's video. Me and the boys from Rufus Ruggs. Now you might be saying to yourself, Um, excuse me, what the actual f*** are you doing in my house? But I can assure you're gonna like this. We've been hard at work creating the best quality and premium hand-tufted rugs money can buy. Now imagine this. You, chilling on your bed, watching a Rufus Stories video, and staring at a rug that's not just a rug. Nope, it's a masterpiece. It's the kind of rug that makes your friends wish they were you. But they're... <laughs> not. And the best part is that these aren't your average cheap quality rugs. Nope, each one is handcrafted by me and the boys. No shortcuts, no robot assembly lines, and no dropshipping BS. Just pure rug grind. Whether you love anime, sports, cars, or anything else you can think of, we can turn it into a rug. So click the first link in the description and have your custom idea come to life.
Story 6 Once, while working for an ISP as an intern, I forgot the where clause in an SQL statement and changed everyone's password to the same thing. By everyone, I mean all the subscribers. Also, the backups of the database were bad, and had been for a month. It was a bad day. So here's the story. I just finished migrating a bunch of mail servers and combining them from a few scattered different disjoint pieces, other IT people were occasionally worse than me, into one consolidated server. This was PostFix and friends. Anyway, we were in a bit of an, oh my god, why did my boss decide we had to do this during business hours, mode when we had someone call in saying they couldn't change the password. Yes, I know, ma'am. Could you wait a day and try and change it tomorrow? We're migrating some stuff. But I need my email now and I forgot my password. She was someone new to the service and we had a hard time getting more clients at the time. Small group, not the best value, but we could get into rural places where Comcast or AT&T wouldn't go. So I decided to try and help her out. So I ask her what she wants it to be and I tell her, okay, this will be taken care of shortly. And then on the screen I see 667 rows updated. Crap. It wasn't a huge operation, but explaining that one was hard. My boss had recently killed a server by yanking out a hot swap hard drive while the machine was booting to show the CEO how they worked. They don't work that way and we lost the box for a few days. So he didn't give me too hard of a time. The failed backups weren't my fault either, so that let some pressure off too. His employers deserve that wake-up call for putting important data in the hands of an intern anyway. Story 7 I used to work at a major appliance warehouse in the summer, and during my first month as a forklift operator, I came around a corner too sharp. The clamp of my lift caught the edge of a refrigerator. I slammed on the brakes, but it was too late. The entire stack of 10 $1,000 fridges, which was about 60 feet high, came crashing down upon my lift and into a subsequent stack of dishwashers. I was terrified. As the second tower came crashing down, I could hear another employee screaming, Oh no, oh no, oh yeah! And all the other lift ops came to watch and laugh at the damage. I proceeded to take the walk of shame to inform the damages manager. Rather than fire me, we all took hunting pictures of me holding up dead dishwashers. Estimated damage, $20,000. Story 8. My little brother and I saw someone make a use of a Molotov cocktail in some action movie. We thought it was the coolest thing ever, and determined we could do the same thing and be little chads. Our first attempt yielded disappointing results. Somehow we neglected to realize the bottles had to be made of glass. Once that was sorted out, we tested our new creations in a big oak tree in a clearing about a mile into the forest behind our house. The bottle full of gasoline exploded just like we expected, and burned that 100-foot old-growth oak down in less than an hour. We were amazed, but soon became terrified when flaming limbs began falling off the tree and setting fire to the tall, dry summer grass nearby. The fire quickly spread to nearby trees and did the only thing we could think to do. Run like hell. That inferno burned for about the next 48 hours until the fire department could finally put it out. It destroyed about 40 acres of forest land, an abandoned house, and part of a horse farm, resulting in some freaked out horses and lots of charred fences. Naturally, we never came forward because we were cowardly little a-holes, but we both went on to volunteer with fire departments wherever we lived to atone for our stupidity and carelessness. Story 9 When my brother and I were five and four, respectively, we were being little devils and refusing to go to bed when we were put there. My parents eventually gave up and just went to bed. They were exhausted as they'd had a dinner party that evening. I probably went into the lounge and went to my parents' entire cassette tape collection, including the memoirs of my grandmother's escape from Germany in 1939, and proceeded to pull out all the tape from the cassettes and play with it. My brother, in the meantime, decided that he was hungry and that he would like a fried egg. In his five-year-old wisdom, he got out an egg and frying pan, put them on the stove, and turned on an element. Nothing happened to the element that he was looking at, so he turned to another one. This time, the heat turned on, and once the pan was hot enough, he started frying his egg. Unfortunately, the first element he turned on had a wooden chopping board which smoldered until the heat reached my mom's food processor, which promptly started burning and melting and resulted in lots of dark black smoke and fire. My brother toddled down to my parents' bedroom and said, Daddy, why is there smoke in the kitchen? And apparently my dad went from horizontal in bed to vertical and halfway down the corridor in about two seconds flat. The fire was quite easily put out at the expense of my parents' nice crockery that was soaking in a bucket nearby. My dad just picked it up and threw it, plates, water and all, on the fire. In the photos of the damage that we had to take for insurance purposes, there's a sort of twisted black mess of the stove and bench area, and then right in the middle of it all is a perfectly cooked fried egg. I hope someone at least ate the egg just so all the work didn't go to waste. If you would have eaten the egg, leave a like in this video and subscribe to the channel. Story 10 A couple of years ago, I was living at my mother's house, and my sister left her neurotic rat terrier with me for a week while she and her mother went on a business trip. The dog was used to going for four walks a day and being coddled and spoiled beyond all description. I was going to school and working nights, so his needs were far beyond my ability to provide. I walked in before school, fed him and left, then walked in between school and work. After a couple of days of this treatment, the dog expressed his displeasure with me by doing his business all over the house. I was frantically trying to clean it up before being late to school, and I just spread borax paste wherever he'd left a mess, figuring a dog, like a cat or a small child, is smart enough not to eat borax. I was wrong. 
When my sister came home from her business trip, I was at school and her dog was almost gone. I got the ream out of my life as she rushed him to the vet. The dog lived, but by then I was so freaked out by almost ending my sister's furry child and the subsequent reaming that I packed up and moved out when her back was turned a couple of days later. So not only did I almost end a dog, but I then caused more havoc when my family interpreted my moving out as me ending it all. Story 11. Not me, but three kids went up on a hill near where I lived and decided to play with fire. They ended up burning down about 40 houses, including mine. Most of the houses were leveled to the ground with nothing left but ashes. The evacuation was quick and many people lost pets and dozens of cars, and other vehicles were also torched. My neighbors were about 12 Mexicans living in one house and they didn't believe in banks and lost all their money. About $7,000. That was in a jar in their basement. It wasn't a rich neighborhood and many didn't have insurance, so most people became homeless. The kids in question came from a rich neighborhood and from what I hear, had no remorse whatsoever. Neither they nor their parents had to pay a single penny. Kids didn't even get a slap on the wrist for what they did. I was just a kid and my family had to live in a car for a few days before the Red Cross put us up in a motel for a couple of months before we could find another place to live. It was in a huge town and with 40 families looking for places to live, it took a while to find a place. If you're ever looking to give money, Red Cross is always a good place to give. That and community action. Story 12. When I was 11 or 12, I went to visit my sister in Germany. We were getting ready for a dinner party she was throwing later that night, so we were busy getting the final items we needed at the local market. It was a bit hectic. As it was a little market, they only had those tiny baskets for all your stuff and no carts, so she asked me to hold the bottle of champagne. As we were waiting in line, I was being a stupid kid and trying to balance the bottle by the punt on one finger. Naturally, I messed it up and dropped the bottle. Anyone who ever dropped a champagne bottle knows those bad boys blow up with force and a lot of noise. This, in a foreign country, is embarrassing enough as is, but then this guy next to me cries out and collapses on the ground, clutching his knee. Red is all over the floor, making a big pool. This lady starts screaming and I just stand there not knowing what the hell happened. Turns out a shard of glass went straight at him. He ended up having to go to the hospital that day and have surgery. The cherry on top? The dude was a mountain climber and he was leaving to climb the Matterhorn the next day. To make things easier, let's just say one of his ropes was frayed and he saved the guy's life. Story 13. I was living in a duplex in Lahaina, Maui. One day, my next door neighbor came over and told me to come look at something. Outside between our two units was a standpipe with a water spigot in the end. It stood about two feet high and was only a couple inches from the house, which was a cinder block structure on a concrete slab. He took the standpipe in his hand and pulled it to the side, so it was about a 45 degree angle. Water came gushing forth from under the house. Well, cool, we thought. Note that he did not turn the faucet. He turned the standpipe like a lever. So for a few days, whenever we had a visitor, we'd show them our amazing water pipe. You already know where this is going. Yes, it happened on my watch. I turned the standpipe and the water came out. Then I turned it back and the water kept coming out. Then it fell over. The pipe was broken and the water was coming out faster than ever. Fortunately, the landlord lived next door. Unfortunately, he wasn't home. There weren't any cell phones in those days and nobody at either duplex had a phone. Not that it would have done any good because I had no idea who to call or what to do. We lived about four blocks from town, which was a street along the waterfront. So I rode my bike down to use a phone. I don't remember who I called, but everybody told me somebody else to call until I was calling a sugar refinery. Then I looked up our street and yes, here it came, the water. A nice, flat, steady stream of water. I watched it run into the gutter and down a drain and then I walked across the street to watch the water leave the drain pipe and onto the beach. It formed a little channel and entered the Pacific Ocean. And I didn't know what the heck to do. So I just sat and tried to wake up from the nightmare. That didn't work either. So I figured I'd best go back to the duplex and start packing my goods. The landlord was waiting for me with a shovel. I'd been ratted. The digging was pretty easy because of all the water washing the soil out, but the break was a long way back. Some plumber guy came a little later and when he arrived, I made myself scarce in the cane field behind the house to check my plants because I needed something. As I sit here and recall this tragic memory, it occurs to me that when I lived at that place, there had been an earthquake. I never thought of it before writing this. That was what weakened the pipe. Maybe. The thing that pissed me off about it was that everybody knew about that pipe, but it had to break when I was demonstrating it. And I was the one who took all the blame. But at least the landlord didn't bill me for it. Story 14. Okay, nothing hugely major, but years ago in like 97, I was on tour with a small musical theater production as the technical director. We were in a chalet-style hotel in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. They gave me a non-smoking room, but at the time I was a pack-a-day smoker, so I smoked in the room. A few hours later, I heard a high-pitched beeping. The source is hard to discern because of the high-pitched ceilings in the room. I look up and see in the light a cloud of cigarette smoke floating near the peak of the angled ceiling, and nearby the smoke detector, which has a little red flashing light. Crap. It seems I set off the smoke alarm. I immediately jumped on the bed, grabbed a pillow, and began fanning over my head. It was a high ceiling and I'm 6'2". The thing wouldn't stop, but oddly enough, the main alarms are not going off. The hotel is not being cleared. 
After minutes of fanning, I cannot take it anymore. I start throwing my shoes at the smoke alarm. A few good days in the drywall later, I scored a direct hit or two. The alarm is damaged, now hanging by the wall by the attached wires. AC alarm, not batteries. Nope, the darn thing won't shut up. In a rage, I grab the aluminum pipe frame suitcase stand, the kind that folds by one leg, and I start jumping on the bed, swinging at the peak of each lap toward the infernal machine. With each miss, the black rubber feet leaves the black streak across the off-white walls. Finally, I scored a direct hit. The alarm flew off its wires across the room, and I swear to God, landed in the waste can near the television. I'm elated. Momentarily, then I realize, dee, 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 it's still there. Does it have a battery backup? How? I get down off the bed and bend over the waste can only to realize that the 80s era hotel television, which had an LED clock on the face, had a built-in alarm clock, which was going off. I hit the faded off button and the beeping finally stopped. I don't think I mentioned it at checkout and I never heard another thing about it. True story. Story 15. I once worked in the gaming machine room of a very busy hotel. I say once because I only worked one eight-hour shift and was promptly fired. My job for the shift was at the cashier's desk exchanging coin winnings from pokey and slot machines into cash notes or taking people's cash and converting it to coins. I was in charge of a little machine that weighed the coins and told you how much cash to return to the customer. It had two settings calibrated to the weight of Australian one and two dollar coins. I was told to select red for one dollar coins and blue for two dollar coins. About five minutes into the shift, I pressed red, freaked out, and pushed blue, which was what I was aiming for in the first place. The screen started blinking, so I pressed blue again and it stopped. I continued my shift working through the line of people that was rarely less than three people deep. Towards the end of my shift, another employee, Dave, came to replenish my till and take away some coins. I had several times been replenished with cash notes. The computer spat out its report and Dave looked a little confused. Quite simply, the bag of coins and the number on the report didn't add up. Not even close. Turns out I had reset the calibration of the weighing machine. I had been handing over fistfuls of cash due to the coin scales reporting the wrong amount. I was never privy to the exact amount, but Dave did tell me on the way to the exit that it was over $15,000. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you made it this far, I'm sure you'll also enjoy. I completely ruined his life. Story 4 was insane. See you in that video.